Welcome to Get Paid for Your Pad, the definitive show on Airbnb hosting, featuring the best advice on how to maximize profits from your Airbnb listing, as well as real life experiences from Airbnb hosts all over the world. Welcome. We are your hosts, Josefa Kapadia and Jasper Rivers. Get paid for your pad. 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 Hey, what's up, everybody? Today, me and Jasper are doing our first episode in remote locations. I am in Michigan visiting my parents, and Jasper is back in his homeland, Holland, Amsterdam, chilling out with all his friends back there, drinking a Dutch beer. He's really happy. (laughs) I'm really happy here, too. And we've got a new guest today. He's got a baby-proof house. Really cool listing. Never seen that kind of a title before, but of course, we'll let him tell you about it. Without further ado, we'd like to welcome Aaron Colby to the show. Hey, guys. It's good to be here. Hey, cool. Glad you're here. So, Aaron, I checked, I checked out your listing, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, but before we get down to the nitty-gritty, why don't you tell us about yourself? I am a, a geek by birth. <laughs> I have geek blood running through my veins. Um, I, I work in the cable industry doing um, tech support for a Java-based network management application. And uh, they, the company uh, has sent me overseas a few times, so it's been really good. Uh, we live uh, in the Portland, Oregon area, just uh, east, east of the city a little bit. And uh, yeah, we have a two-year-old daughter, and uh, my wife is a stay-at-home mom. Truth be told, her job is much harder than mine. For sure. And now, so you have a two-year-old, and this, I assume, is the basis for the baby proofing. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. Awesome. And so I understand there's some connection between you and Jasper. Can we get into that a little bit? Sure. Um, my, my employer had me working out of our Amsterdam office to uh, work on site with our largest uh, European customer, who is UPC. So I, I lived over in Holland for uh, just shy of two years, uh, over three trips, and um, that's how I got my start with Airbnb. When we were over there, um, all of our leisure travel was done uh, using Airbnb listings. Our, our first place was a little villa in uh, the Tuscany region of Italy, and the family there was so nice to us and made such a good impression on us that we used Airbnb listings for uh, all of our leisure travel when we were over there in Europe. It was great. So, Aaron, I have UPC, and my TV is currently not receiving all the channels, so I'm not very happy with their service. (laughs) Well, uh that's on them because I just work on the system that detects outages. So if they know about an outage, they have to fix it. Okay, so there's no way for me to blame that on you, right? No, sir. <laughs> nice, nice try. <laughs> um, so you lived in in Amstel, Vain, is it? I did. Yes, we we uh, we lived in the hotel apartments, uh, just kitty corner to the Ziekenhaus Amstelland. That's where okay. my daughter my daughter was born. Right. Right. You told me about that then. You know, I, I'm very familiar with the area. I'm currently in Amsterdam. And I'm just curious, like, what, what was your experience in Holland? Did you like it? Oh, yeah. Very much so. Very much so. Been back there three times. Okay. What, was, what were the, the biggest positives and the biggest negatives? Um... The biggest positives was it's a very good place to raise a family and uh, going from here where everything is so spread out, you have to drive a car to there where the transit is fantastic and you can ride a bike pretty much everywhere. Um, It was just, it was really nice. Um, 
the biggest negatives, uh, unfortunately, we, we found it very difficult to make friends with Dutch people. Mm -hmm. Most of our friends were other expats. And that's, right. it's, it's kind of ironic because my wife comes from a Dutch family. Mm -hmm. So, it's um, funny that... Mentioned, it's funny that you mentioned that because one of, one of the things I really like about the U.S. is how easy it is to connect with people. Yes. So yeah. I, can, I, can, I can relate to what you're saying. Um, the, the other thing that was bad about Holland was the service when you would go into restaurants. Even if you were, <laughs> a, re even if you were a regular, the service was just terrible. Yep. I totally so. agree. <laughs> totally agree yeah. on that as well. It, it, it's, it's much different over here. But I, I think there are uh, problems with the system here too because... Uh, the service staff is uh, completely dependent on their tips to earn a living, right. and they're not so much. Right, that's true, and it's it's very expensive to hire people here. So yeah. that's why generally the restaurants and bars are understaffed. Hmm. You know, I guess there's a bad and a, and a good thing about it. People do get a decent salary working in the restaurants, but the service generally isn't as good. Cuff. Cafe Anno 1890 on the uh, Amstel Fancefe was one of our favorite places to go. Okay, I haven't been there. I'll, I'll check that out. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get started and uh, talk sure. about your, your Airbnb listing. So how did you get started as a host? Um, well, I, I do computer work for my day job, and I also do computer work on the side. But uh, when... When it hit me how easy it would be to list one of our rooms on the site, it seemed like even though um, I can't make the same rate of income as fast with Airbnb as I can doing computer work, it seems less demanding on my time uh, and, and mu much easier on us as a family in terms of freeing me up to spend time uh, with my wife and daughter. So we, we decided when we got back, uh, we wanted a house big enough to have um, uh, an office for me to do my work because I'm keeping uh, mostly European hours. My workday starts at four in the morning. Um, and also to have an extra room for, for guests. And eventually we uh, got that bedroom ready and listed it on the website and it was very slow at first we uh based on our experience with our first guest we almost didn't continue um and and it wasn't um he was just a little strange i don't know how else to put it he he, he didn't do anything um to you know, he didn't cause any damage or anything. He, it just, uh, the, the situation was a little strange. But uh, I, I know that you are going to ask me if uh, we had any concerns about uh, letting random people from the Internet uh, come into our house. We certainly did. Um, and uh, other than the, the, the first person, you know, he, he was um, – um, a little, a little different. Uh, other than him, it's been a really good experience. You're just running out a room, right? You're not running out your whole place. Uh, we have two bedrooms listed on our place. Uh, uh, two bedrooms listed from our house. Two, two bedrooms. Okay. Yes. And that's in Portland, Oregon, correct? Yes. Um, it's actually just outside of Portland, uh, in Clackamas. So you mentioned before that you have a two-year-old daughter. As you've brought in guests into your home, um, as a, as a parent of a young child, what what have you? How has that modified the way you've approached this, or what precautions have you taken to sort of keep your keep your young child in earshot, or you know what 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 have you guys done differently? Um, well. Initially, when we listed the first bedroom, we didn't mention anything about our daughter at all. And she's generally pretty quiet and uh, stays downstairs in the living room. Um, my wife, like I said, is a stay-at-home mother, so 
um, she's, she's home pretty much all the time, or if she's out, uh, she'll typically take our daughter, uh, with her. So there, there haven't been any situations where, uh, there's been a real cause for concern. Um, her bedroom is close to ours, uh, upstairs. All, all, all the bedrooms are upstairs and the, the first Airbnb listing is at the front of the house. So it's, it's, uh, a distance from, uh, her bedroom. And then once we listed the second bedroom on Airbnb, it's directly across the hallway from her bedroom. But you know, the, there haven't been any issues. Most of the time, the people wanting to uh, come stay with us, it's been pretty much to have a place to sleep. And uh, there hasn't been any real concern about exposure to our daughter or anything like that. You know, and, and and we haven't had any issues either. As, as a matter of fact, um, when we've extended invitations to guests to have meals with us, um, it, it's been good experiences with our daughter. You know, she she will uh, engage with the guests a, a little bit too, and and she typically wants to say hello and and uh, see them off when they go. Like uh, the the last gentleman that we had stay with us, she didn't get a chance to say goodbye to him, so she was a little upset that you know she said, "Where did he go?" <laughs> And and when when they walk out the front door, sometimes she'll say, "Thank you for coming to Chloe's house." <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah. So when you so when you now now your listing clearly advertises right baby proofed house, which is really yes. cool because I haven't seen that before. Now that you've phrased it that way or marketed it that way, do you notice or have you noticed an influx of parents that bring kids or younger kids to your house? Um. Let's see. We had we had a, a father and daughter uh, come stay with us for a sports tournament, but that was before we changed the, the format of the listing. Um, Chip Chip Conley, the director of hospitality for Airbnb, came and did a presentation at the Portland office. And one of the things that he said to the hosts was, if you're trying to market your listing like your Montgomery Ward, stop it. If there's something negative about your listing or something potentially negative about your listing, put it front and center. Because what that does is it builds trust with people. It builds trust with people who want to uh, find places to stay on the site. And if you're putting all that stuff up front, then there's no illusions. You know, there's no, you're not creating a situation where they wonder if you haven't said something about your child, what else are you hiding? That's absolutely right. Another thing that we recommend in our book and on the podcast as well. So that's, that's a great tip, by the way, from Chip. Another thing is too, is in essence, disclose whatever is there and also uh, be honest about the surroundings and what's going on because the the, the fastest path to a negative review or something something you know, getting your guests perturbed is by concealing something or misleading somebody and then they get there and it's not what they expected and you have to remember that these people have planned an entire trip around this booking being what they thought it was supposed to be right so that's a really good point and and um, now, with your that, – that's so interesting. And then when – I'm just very curious about the baby-proofing. Can you just tell me a little bit about what does that mean? What have you baby-proofed in the house to make it a fully baby-proofed uh, rental unit? Uh, in that respect, it's doing things like uh, removing breakable items from places that kids can reach, making sure that they're – are no uh, exposed electrical cords or glass or anything fragile that uh, kids can get into and break. And um, I'm straying a little bit from, from your question, but back to how we're advertising the listing, um, I, I'm thinking we may even change it up just a little bit more to say, Look, r real life happens downstairs, so it's not immaculate because we have a two-year-old here and she plays with toys and they're all over the place. 
but upstairs, the rooms, you know, wh where the guests stay, of course, that's immaculate. You know, and I was thinking maybe we should just say that because everybody that I've mentioned it to ahead of time, even though I haven't talked about the toys and everything in the listing, they're like, oh, no problem. It's nice to be part of your real life, you know, and not feel like I have to walk around on eggshells. So it's, it's actually been rather liberating to say, yeah, this is our house. You know, we have a two-year-old who makes a mess, and we're not worried about keeping everything absolutely immaculate downstairs for the guests. But, of course, you know, since we want the experience for the guests to be good, this, the rooms where they stay, of course, everything is very clean and, and organized. And I think that's one of the charms about Airbnb and staying with real people is that you're not you know you're not staying in a in a hotel room you're staying with actual people who have a life and they you know children are part of of life yeah so uh, you know i i think that's that's actually one of the reasons that people like to stay at airbnb places that they get the experience being part of you know a family or just the local life or whatever it's going on absolutely and and I, I think I would actually, in, in terms of giving advice to other hosts, I would tell them to be more real about what their place is like. You know, uh, of course, you're going to keep the, the listing um, as clean as possible for the guests. But if you got kids, say so. You know, just, just be real because absolutely. I, I think people understand that and they appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. And it's all about expectation management like Josefa said before people want to know what to expect and that's why we always tell people make sure your listing is very accurate because if you're if you're promising something that you can't deliver on that's when people get disappointed right so I think uh, I think it's really good what you're doing um, I think it seems like the guests are very satisfied with their experience you have Five star ratings, pretty much all across the board. Um, I, I'm reading some of the reviews that you've gotten, and they seem really positive. So maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, about how do you how do you create that that perfect guest experience? Um, we we like uh, hospitality, anyway. So it was one of the things that I talked to my wife about before we got married. I had uh, some friends here extend hospitality to me uh, and, and make me feel very welcomed and very loved. And, you know, on a very big scale, there were a lot of different people that would have me over and everything. And it was such a blessing to me. I wanted to be that way to other people. So we like having friends and guests over for dinner. It was something that's just kind of grown that way in, in our marriage so with the guests here for airbnb it's pretty easy because we you know that's how we are anyways we strive to be welcoming to to strangers anyways and uh we like to engage the uh, the guests as much as they want to be engaged you know like we uh our, our last guest she came and had dinner with us uh, one night, but the rest of the time she was pretty private and kept to herself. And, you know, we kind of feel that out on a case-by-case -case basis. And the, the way we'll do that is typically in, invite them uh, over for, for a family meal. And uh, we, we haven't had anybody turn us down yet. And it's, it's just been really good. Um, That's 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 great, you know what you're what you just mentioned because we we do get some questions from hosts sometimes when they ask us how much interaction should I have with the guests? You know, should I should I invite them for for meals or should I make them breakfast or should I show around, show them around town? And I think it's really important to get a feel for what the guest is looking for because some people just want to be by themselves, whereas other people want to engage with the host right they are looking for that experience so i think it's it's really good that you try to get a sense for that and uh, oh yeah it it, it kind of reminds me of um 
Rochelle Short's book, uh, where she talks about not cooking, uh, her, her book, uh, letting people in, I've been following your podcast and, and um, y- your book as well as I- I've read Letting People In and, um, you know, her, th- where she mentions that she doesn't cook for people, you know, and she says that the guests or the hosts that do good for you, that's, you know, your thing. I, I think it's like that. You just got to play it by ear, you know, and uh, get a sense for how much interaction the guest wants and just go with the flow. So, Aaron, you mentioned that you had read our book. I'd love to hear what your major takeaways were after you read it and, and thought about your listing. Um, well, reading your book uh, coincided with um, going and seeing uh, the Chip Conley presentation, and it was just more confirmation that we needed to not make our listing so sterile, you know, just be, because we had uh, a, a picture of the bedroom and some pictures of the house where the house was absolutely immaculate, but it's not typically like that. We cleaned it up for the pictures. And uh, I, I think that, uh, people need to be more real, more realistic, more honest and accurate in your listing because uh, I, I think that's what's going to establish trust between the host and potential guests. Um, the other thing which uh, I, I need to go back and reread is your um, your pricing formula because um, I, I didn't uh, go all the way through that chapter yet, but we found when we lowered our prices some, we started to get more inquiries. And uh, we have two bedrooms, but uh, they each accommodate two people. But if you are searching for accommodations for four, neither one of those would come up. So we ended up creating a third listing for both bedrooms. Yep. And um, I, I, I think the Airbnb needs to iron some things out too, because the experience between the website and the mobile apps isn't consistent. And there are still some bugs and issues to be worked out. Like when you establish um, daily pricing uh, and a customer goes and searches uh, for your listing, it still lists uh, your set price rather than what you've got set for the day. So if I set, uh, if I have my listing set at $55 a night and I've lowered the price for the day to 40 or $35 a night, then um, it doesn't show that. It still shows the normal $55 a night. Right. It always shows the sort of the standard price that you set. Yeah. And um, that's a good point. Uh, we'll, we'll pass it on to the Airbnb people as we're in conversation with them. And I've know you know I know Aaron you you were very active in the uh, Airbnb Academy Facebook group that comes the membership comes with the book and there's a there's a few things that people have mentioned that they would like to have improved so we'll make sure to pass it on to the team at Airbnb HQ and hopefully they'll make these improvements in the future. Yeah. One one question I I have I know you've we've talked about this before where you're looking to get a few more bookings yes you're, you're not 100 percent um uh fully booked usually i've noticed right. that you have a strict cancellation policy i'm just curious why did you choose the strict policy i i guess it was just uh, initially we didn't want somebody to flake out uh and, and cancel at the last minute we were hoping for for the extra income, so it made sense to set the strict policy. Do, mm-hmm. do you think that makes a difference? I recommend you change it to either flexible or moderate. And the reason is when people know that they can cancel for free, for free, they're more eager to book. And you'll see this on hotel booking websites as well, where where these days, you know, on booking.com, a lot of the hotels, you can book and cancel the last day. And in reality, I've had a flexible 
policy for a while. I, I changed it at some point to moderate, but the amount of cancellation that you'll actually get is very, very, very few. It's just kind of a peace of mind for people that they know they're not totally committed to it. And it just encourages them to book because in their minds, they are thinking, oh, I can just book this. And if I don't want it, then I can, I can cancel it later. But they hardly ever do. So okay. I think definitely when you're, when you're not having uh, a close to 100% occupancy, I would definitely recommend starting with the flexible just to get those bookings in. And it's better to have a booking that gets canceled than to have no booking at all. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm open to suggestions because, uh, yeah, this, this is a learning experience for me and, and, uh, having the extra income is nice. So I, I want to do, uh, whatever is going to make that easier. It's, it's interesting because that's, that's a good general piece of advice to follow and we say this a lot of times is that since you are essentially building something akin to a hotel or a, a resort, a lot of times if you follow the industry standard that will usually make the most sense because it will be consistent with the guest experience that they've had and they'll, and they'll want to stick with that. So that's, that's definitely a good piece of advice. So we, we essentially guide most of our readers in the same direction when it comes to cleaning, check-ins, etc. Okay. Um, now, you know what I'd love to know as well? So you talked about how you had these excellent, uh, you've had these excellent experiences on the guest side. I'd love to hear, and I may be hard to pinpoint one, but I'd love to hear your best experience as a host with a guest that really vibed with your family and who made a lasting impression. Uh, we had a guest named James recently from Britain and he was just great. He was really good to talk to. He engaged with our daughter and, and you know, it, it was really good. He was fun, fun to spend time with and get to know and, uh, very personable and everything. And, and, um, our, our last guest, she, she was really nice to spend time with as well. We didn't get to see her as much. She was uh, m more private, but yeah, the, the guy from Britain was definitely the most enjoyable guest so far. And did you make fun of his accent? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no. Did he have one or? <laughs> oh, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> you've, you've always you've got to make fun of their accents. That's what I do to Yasper on a regular basis. <laughs> The yeah. English have a very good sense of humor, so I think you can get away with making fun of them. No, what, what was funny is he, uh, part of his family is from Scotland, so he would actually make fun of them because there's uh, some animosity between them with Scotland wanting to uh, secede. Right. So it was, it was fun listening to him tell those stories. <laughs> That's funny. But you mentioned... Um, you you were looking to make some extra income with with renting out the rooms. What do you have a particular purpose for the extra income? Um, yes, it's called the retirement plan. The retirement plan. Okay. Yes, uh, and the retirement plan at this point is to pay down the mortgage as quickly as possible. Okay. Oops. So we're we're gonna do a mix of that, and I I told my wife uh, recently that since she's the one doing the heavy lifting uh, in terms of keeping the rooms clean and and maintained and everything, that she deserves to uh, enjoy the fruits of her labor. So uh, we're planning a trip to the Oregon coast, and we'll uh, eat our own dog food, so to speak, and go to an Airbnb listing there and spend a weekend at the coast, just the two of us. That sounds so, like, yeah. a, that sounds like yeah, a great trip. Oh yeah. We're, we're going to use some of it for uh, vacation travel of our own too. But the primary, the primary purpose is to, uh, pay down the house quicker. That's a great purpose. And, you know, it's interesting. People use the money for different things. Some people use it to renovate their house. I personally have used the income to basically travel around the world full time, 
which was pretty mind blowing to me that that was even possible. And some people use it to pay off their mortgage or pay for their health insurance. And it's just awesome that, you know, having a spare room enables you to make this extra income and improve your life in whatever area you want to improve it on. Absolutely. So Aaron, we have gotten a great story from you. We've gotten to talk about your baby proof listing, which again is so cool, such a cool title. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, having you on the show. Now, if people want to, now people hear your story and they want to get in touch with you either about staying with you or hear about what your experience has been having a young child and renting out, where can they get in touch with you? Um, they can get in touch with me on my uh, work website, which is longviewbits.com. Okay, longviewbits.com. We will make sure to include that in the show notes. So, Aaron, uh, I'd just like to say thank you for being on. Thank you for, for getting our book and reading it. We really appreciate it. We love getting the word out there. Uh, guys, by the way, our book is officially on Kindle on Amazon right now. It was launched a couple days ago, so you can go ahead, go on Amazon Kindle, search for Get Paid for Your Pad. You can check out the full version. Uh, also, if you want more information on how to rent out your home, you can go to www.getpaidforyourpad.com. Dot com. And if you want today's show notes, you want to write, see Aaron's contact information, uh, you can go to www.getpaidforyourpad.com forward slash podcast. All right. And without further ado, that is our show. Aaron, thanks again. Guys, we'll see you next time every Mondays and Thursdays. Get paid for your pad. Get paid for your pad. Get paid for your pad.